Wake that ass up. LA's number one hip hop morning show is Nick Cannon Mornings on Power 106. Nick Cannon Radio. Uh, this is a special moment for me. Uh, we we on the front lines right now in so many different ways. Uh, we've been protesting on the air. Uh, and I've been having the opportunity to have conversations with people that I admire, that I look up to. But the person I'm speaking with right now, I truly wouldn't have the energy and the fortitude and uh, the wherewithal <laughs> that I have if it wasn't wasn't for this person. She truly is the battery in my back. Uh, the person who encouraged me to to complete my degree and get it in criminology. Uh, and it wasn't based off of just her words. It was her actions. We've been in prison systems all over the country. Uh, she's created her own experience uh, when it comes to, to programs and reform, uh, when it comes to criminal justice, uh, a Ph.D. in criminology and administration of justice. And my personal professor, the one and only Dr. Muhammad. How you yes. doing? Yes, I am doing as best as I can in light of everything that's going on. Um, I am breathing and up today, so I definitely am excited about that. But. It's a lot going on. A lot of students are, you know, reaching out. A lot of officers reaching out. It's it's a lot going on. But um, I still have a smile on my face. I'm still reading a whole lot of books, yeah. um, and really just thinking about ways of strategizing to move forward. Doc, you've taught classes on this. I've you've you graded me <laughs> and, and and my reports and, and dissertations on exactly what we're going through right now. I mean, I remember one of our policing class where we did the the ride alongs with with law enforcement uh, where we've had we had law enforcement come from Baltimore and, and Texas and, and come and speak with us. Men and women of color uh, all the way up to, you know, the, the highest uh, offices and government speaking on this to see this hit in such a way and to say that it was ignited by law enforcement how do you feel about that oh i feel like part of me wants to say like this is nothing new right. you know you know and i know about the history of slave patrols and you know the enticement um, and the ways that law enforcement has been used um, as an avenue. But I also understand about the um, funding that's going into mm. law enforcement. Exactly. And also to counter that, the increase in wanting to expand the capacity of prisons and jails. So you're starting to see um, in areas where uh, gentrification is happening that they're beginning to build these correctional facilities. And so I could definitely see, you know, historically, um, currently how that is a reality. Um, I am not myself focused specifically on that because it will immobilize you. And I think it's very important during this time that we can keep momentum right. and keep moving. Um, and so, yes, there are individuals that are enticing. There are individuals uh, that are amongst the protesters that are, you know, aggravating um, and agitating the situation. Um, but we have to remain focused. We have to maintain um, our sanity and stay as one as opposed to focusing and romanticizing white supremacy because mm. I feel like that's what ends up happening. We end up looking at that more than we end up looking at ourselves, our families, and our communities. Man, that's so powerful that you say that. And like I said, I've learned so much from you. I, I bow down to your wisdom. One of the things that you taught me early on that intrigued me, and when I say this, people, I see people's eyebrows perk up. Uh, when I say criminology, is the study of a black man. Uh, can you break that down uh, and, you know, how we came to that conclusion uh, for, you know, what we have degrees in? Right, right. It's it's a difficult concept, Nick. You know, those eyebrows go up because people are like, how you know that, bro? Like, <laughs> you know, those are things that you're not going to learn necessarily in a textbook, but being a trained criminologist, and when I say trained, I mean undergraduate degree, master's degree, and doctoral uh, degree um, in this particular area. And one of the things that I just started noticing is all of the theories, you know, you look at all of the theories of the dead white men <laughs> and how they looked at black folk. Right. How they look specifically at black brothers, you know, right. women started coming into play uh, more contemporary um, studies that expanded those. 
But really, when you look at the research questions and the methodology behind the theories that captured the data in terms of creating the narrative around it, you have questions like, why is crime concentrated in the lower class? Mm. When you talk about the lower class, these are studies in socially disorganized communities and therefore hence a new theory that kind of emerges. And what they began to do was look at why black and brown bodies were committing crimes. Um, you start to see that a lot of the criminological theories are morbid. You know, they are deadly. They are dehumanizing. And not everyone, because specifically white collar crime is not included in the FBI statistics. Mm. When you think about the now. measuring of crime, mm -hmm. which is taught in every criminal justice class, it starts with the framework of statistics. Right. Where do we get our numbers from? And if we're not counting those individuals through the FBI statistics that are white collar criminals, we leave a whole group of whiteness out of these equations. Um, and therefore it falls on us as the ones that are um, committing the most crimes that are doing all of the crimes that deserve to be enslaved through the 13th Amendment, deserve to be incarcerated, deserve to you know, have a knee on our neck um, right. because we're only a percentage of a person. Um, those sort of things come out of these negative uh, theories. And you start to find now uh, Dr. Williams at Montclair State University, Dr. Jason, he does a lot of work on decolonizing um, criminology. And you right. start to see that individuals now during this movement, even for today, hashtag um, Blackout Tuesday, individuals are calling on ASC, which is the American Society of Criminology, who has remained silent, or the American Society of Criminal Justice Sciences, which are these large agencies that are ultimately stepping back. Right. It's a difficult uh, it's a difficult concept uh, when you think about um, all of the negativity that yeah. goes into the ways we have to frame new data. So even with a Ph.D., you are oftentimes challenged to connect it to these morbid theories. And therefore, you're bringing depth to your population and to your community. Right. Well, you and it's so complex. Uh, and, and like I said, we we studied it. We we have discourse about it. Uh but to simplify it and in the spirit of an abolitionist, we see the issues, we see the problem. Therefore, not only do we need reform, we need to do away with law enforcement. And I people look at me like I'm a radical. They say I'm crazy when I say let's get rid of the police. 100 percent. Let's let's rem remove police officers. Let's take all the funding away from police officers and create peace officers. Let's create a, an entire new organization, entire new department from which people who live in the community are funded to take care of their community. Why isn't that realistic? Uh, and why can't we have our institutions uh, help perpetuate that message? I mean, it's unrealistic because it's not going to fill the prison system. It's not <laughs> Talk about it. <laughs> you know, white supremacy, it's not going to um, allow for the black man, the black family to not be disconnected, um, uh, to be bamboozled, to be fooled, to be, you know, out of control. And therefore, those sort of things become unrealistic. So it's almost like we live in the opposites, you know, of reality. Yeah. Um, when you think about the Jewish community, you think about models where you are not ever amazing models. You will never. You will never <laughs> you cannot infiltrate whatsoever. No, no, because they the, don't play the, that. It's not a cohesiveness of the community. Um, the ways that they police themselves, yeah. the ways that they engage in um, service for their communities, Absolutely. the way that they spend their dollars, because uh, let's be honest, all of this from education all the way to the top is all about education because education is what tied to politics. It's yeah. very political Indeed. and the political actions are what gets individuals in those seats. So I'm hoping that people are listening today and, you know, engaging in protesting, but also, you know, taking up their uh, privilege and their rights to vote. To local I think vote. we need to think about peace officers. I think that we need to hold law enforcement accountable. I think that we need to begin to empower those within our community that are already our protectors, already our protectors, right. and are seen as the ones that are being demonized and the ones that are being thrown away um, and chastised and not listened to. I think that one of the things that you find is that um, that causes fear 
in the right. hearts of individuals because an educated black family right. with a weapon or with the power to control becomes the issue. And we see that now playing itself um, out in the streets. Let's talk about that for a minute. The mindsets, the even the, when it comes to eugenics, going all the way back to, you know, Darwin's cousin and <laughs> and all of those people. And they, they, they really felt that uh, there was an entire community of feeble mindedness. There was an entire community of lesser thans that needed to be cleansed, needed to be done away with, shouldn't be allowed to have children that they couldn't take care of. And all of these concepts that even today are perpetuated through law enforcement, that there is a group of people there's a certain class level that need to be policed, that need to be overseen. And when they don't follow the rules, then they need to be punished and captured and thrown in cages. And for some reason, everybody's fine with that. But as soon as you start tearing up some buildings or setting things on fire and doing damage to people's property, that's when people want to get upset. They don't want to get upset at the infrastructure that is set up to treat people like animals worse than animals because last time i checked there wasn't a police system for animals no no um man it's a it's an interesting concept that if i if you got I'm a praying, degree in it you got a doctor in it <laughs> you're a doctor in our in this system yes yeah, like if you if i get you to believe that you are less than then I can use your hands for work, free mm. labor. Come on, Rockefeller said, I don't want thinkers, so, I want workers. I want a nation want full of workers. Yeah, and at the <laughs> end of the day, that's what it boils down to. We have never been in a situation where we didn't know how to take care of our children and our families. In fact, we were the ones suckling the white woman's children. <laughs> Taking care um, of them. On the, you know, slave fields. And then you create a policy that dehumanizes me, and then you create a program um, called welfare to work. Mm. Um, so when the Black Panthers created that and they were giving food to these different homes and different houses, that was our way of resisting. That was the way that we protested. That was the way that we mobilized. It only didn't happen out in the streets and the government saw that. Right. Um, under the surveillance of the American injustice systems. Right. Um, and oftentimes they take that and just mess it up. Yeah. You know, this is, this is my version of it and I'm going to make it look shiny and make it look good. Right. In all actuality, you, you're you building laziness. Mm. Um, you're bridging a divide so that you can use those statistics to conquer. And then you don't include the st statistics the same way you do through the FBI um, statistics, not including white collar crime. You don't include white collar individuals on welfare. And therefore, it makes it seem like it's only me. But all of that is part of the negative rhetoric. And the way that you overturn that is to talk about resilience. It and is positive rhetoric. <laughs> positive rhetoric. And what they had us to believe is that talk is cheap. Mm. You know, but yeah. it wasn't cheap when you stole it out of my mouth, when you <sighs> ripped me from Africa and brought me over here. Yeah. And you listened to every word that I said so that you could code switch to take over. Uh, so that uh. you could steal an entire people and a country come Continent. on they ain't ready for all at of that at the end of the day <laughs> once you get your narrative back mm. once you begin to tell your own stories which you're starting to see now and once you begin to feed into the positive not stopping the mobility and not stopping um the resistance but at the same time continuing to share the story of protesters are out there feeding each other mm. individuals up stores uh, for one another. Individuals Indeed. are out there with water there. You know, there's pictures of individuals that are holding hands and dragging individuals, you know, um, to spaces of safety. You don't never hear those stories because you want to still show this animalistic nature to be able to measure up to the history. And right. there's just no measuring up. There's no way that you could paint black folk to measure up to the history of the America KKK. Uh, say it one time. And now I want to talk solutions for a moment. You and I uh, personally went to Africa, uh, spent time in Uganda and, and saw the prison systems and the incarceration systems over there, specifically dealing with children of incarcerated individuals, 
and we saw solutions. I didn't, it, it was, it was eye opening to me. And I thank you for this, that I didn't think I'd have to go all the way to Africa to understand, uh, how we can have solutions here, uh, in America, specifically in our, our incarceration system, but to take care the, the way that there was a, a, a program where they put extra time, effort and resources into children of incarcerated individuals to break the cycle. And it feels like that should be an easy concept when it comes to breaking the cycle here in the States to where. And, but again, like you said, if we broke that cycle, then big business wouldn't be able to benefit from the classism and the capitalism that keeps us all enslaved. So real solutions when it comes to our our, not just our enslavement that we're currently experiencing, but in our safety. What right. would you say in, in closing? Number one, the babies. Number one, the babies. You know, like the world is going to look at you different when you begin to care for those babies. Mm. Um, when we begin to educate them, when we begin to make sure that they are our number one priority, that's what we saw in Africa. Mm -hmm. We saw, uh, you know, a honing in to the next generation to be able to uplift them and hold them. The they were so, they were so had, sharp. Those kids, like yeah. four or five years old, is so, so potent, so powerful, mm -hmm. so, so well versed in, in their mission. Yeah, that's all of our babies, you know, yeah. outside of technology that they put in their face and <laughs> make yeah. you think that that's the best babysitter when in all actuality, we have to be explaining to our children what's happening right now. Right. We have to be explaining to them what the strategies are and including them in the dialogue and conversation, because although they may not develop mentally, be able to say things, you can operationalize it on your end. I think as a parent, though, yeah, like, I mean, you have a, a newborn son that is going to be faced with uh, the adversity of law enforcement. You have two beautiful daughters. What do you say to them? You tell them the truth. You tell them the truth. You teach them the history. When you think about the Japanese internment camps, they have the most books to educate children on what the United States did to them, not for adults, but for children, the most children books that explain mm. the oppression, mm. the discrimination, the disregard, the abuse. They wanted children to understand because that's where you break the cycle. What we're finding now is that we're out there, we're protesting, we're putting a lot of stuff on Instagram. You better get on TikTok if you want to educate, you know, the next population. That's where Talk they are. Talk about it. Talk um, about and it. When individuals start seeing stuff like that, it changes the paradigm. We need to educate these young folk. They out there burning stuff down. Power to the people. Yeah. But do you know that there's no social distancing when you get incarcerated on a Friday and you stuck in there until Monday? to see a judge. Yeah. We have to begin to educate. I saw one picture with a young individual out there with flip flops, bruh. <laughs> you don't go to a protest with, with flip flops. flops. So. If you go, let somebody in your home be the one that's tying your laces, giving you your socks. We have to work together. There are gonna be people that have to take care of the elderly. Yeah. There are gonna be people that have to homeschool the children. There are gonna be people that have to clean you up and patch you up before you go back out. This is for the long haul. Yeah. And if you're not taking care of your mind, body, and soul, it means it's a wrap for all of us. We all have to begin to love one another. And when I say love one another, I'm not talking about hugs and kisses, and I'm talking about respect. Right, talk that I'm talking talk. about teamwork. Indeed. I'm talking about uplifting the full community, not one or the other, but the full community with ultimately the most important player in it all, the children. Yeah. The children are the most important, you know, players in it all. One of the things that I saw uh, uh, in terms of the incident that's going on now was that before there was a knee in the neck of an individual outside of a cop car, there was a younger individual who called the police. Um, and there was a lot going on in terms of, you know, speaking about them, outing them, putting them out there on the front line or, you know, they recorded and engaged in that sort of way. But there was no protection for the younger individuals. When you don't connect, connect or you don't control or protect your kin, then you also are seen as disposable. So Indeed. the way that we strategize and the way that we maneuver, know that you are being watched and we've been watched from the time that we were stolen and brought here. Say and that. so if we continue to keep doing the same things, then we don't force the think tank of white supremacy to have to do anything. 
but continue to roll. Once we start changing up and working together, then that's what causes that fear. There it is. I couldn't have said it any better uh, myself, but uh, why would I? You're my professor. I learned from you. Uh, you educate me. And as Mandela said, you know, education is the greatest weapon in which to change the world. So we appreciate you educating us in this moment and continuing to, Doc. Uh, we going to talk soon. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. You take care. Stay strong. I love you. Talk to you love soon. You Peace. Peace.